Well, welcome everybody, it's uh, Paul Lowe here, one of the founding members of OpenEye, and we're delighted today to, uh, to introduce you to the Bag News Notes team, who are going to be facilitating today's webinar, which is looking at the impact of the uh, visual coverage of the BP oil spill. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael Shaw to explain to you a little bit about Bag News Notes and how they work and who today's participants are. Hi, I'm Michael Shaw, and I wanted to welcome you to the first Bag News Salon at OpenEye. I wanted to thank Paul for hosting us and uh, say what an honor it is to have uh, John Moore, Erica Blumenfeld, and Carrie Goodnow with us as well, um, as well as Sandra Roa, the editor of Bagnus Salon, Lorette Steinberg, who completely produced this discussion, our talented moderator and visual rhetorician, Kara Finnegan, as well as visual experts, Nate Stormer and John Levy of Photo 8. And uh, yes, I'm very happy to have a mixed British and American panel on this story. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about the salon, our process, and the Bag News site. Uh, this is our seventh salon, having looked into photos on Haiti, Obama, Katrina in New Orleans, 9-11, etc. Uh, it's also the first time we're using live video instead of text chat, and we're interested to see how a freeform discussion will work on this platform, especially since uh, OpenEye has never done an unstructured discussion like this before. Um, at Bag News, we feel we have a unique mission when it comes to photojournalism. If others relate to photographs more for their informational content or their backstory, at Bag News, we're particularly concerned with the photo itself. We're interested in two things. First, what is the function of the actual photo as an emotionally and intellectually charged element in the media, as, a, as well as the uh, cultural and political sphere? Second. We're interested in how much we can understand from a particular photo, if we consider it like a cultural mirror and read it more like a short story. Um, assuming a strong photo is much richer than people imagine in details, storylines, suggestions, contradictions, associations, and, um, and, and ironies. Finally, if you're not familiar with Bag News itself, the site is a daily meeting place for concerned citizens and activists, photographers, and visual experts and academics to discuss and debate the key images of our times. Our notes section analyzes visual politics and our originals section, edited by photographer Alan Chin, uh, publishes photojournalism, emphasizing our unique approach. So uh, we encourage everyone to visit regularly, to comment, to visit our Facebook group, and also follow us on Twitter. Uh, all that said, I now give you Kara Finnegan. What I wanted to do before we dive into this image, which is uh, a great way to start our discussion, is to briefly mention that we're honored to have several photographers um, who have been working actively in the Gulf joining us today. Um, I want to introduce especially three of them whose photographs appear in this edit, and we will talk to them and about the, these photographs as we move through today. John Moore is a senior staff photographer for Getty Images who has extensively covered war, uh, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. He's won numerous awards for his work, including sharing a 2005 Pulitzer Prize for breaking news photography for coverage of the war in Iraq. Carrie Goodnow is a freelance and documentary photographer based in Mobile, Alabama. Her work covers a wide range of topics um, in the region and stories along the Gulf Coast. Uh, she's been working on those as a freelancer. Uh, most recently with Bloomberg News, and she's also interested in documenting stories often missed by the mainstream media. The third photographer who's with us, whose work we will discuss today, is Erica Blumenfeld. She's an artist and documentary photographer working on The Polar Project, a series of environment-based art installations. And most recently, she's been filing reports on the Gulf in collaboration with uh, independent journalist Dar Jamal. I also want to note the presence of Gerald Herbert, uh, another photographer who has been doing uh, work in the Gulf as well. We're really honored to have everyone here today, and especially these guest photographers who are willing to uh, share their work and talk with us about their work. But Michael um, emphasized uh, that the role of the bag is really to uh, read the pictures, as the bag slogan says, and to talk about the images. And so we wanted to begin today by this image, uh, which is an image of, among other things, the journalist Anderson Cooper. To me, this image encapsulates um, a lot of what the bag is about, how news and politics are visualized by media and in media. And in particular, Michael talked about the notion of uh, images reflecting. Uh, and so uh, at this point, I invite folks to uh, jump in and comment, and let's, uh, let's get going on the images here. I guess uh, yeah, Lorette. Uh, Lorette here. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, 
ask the photographers who are here um, what they think when they see this photograph. I mean, we we know that all of you who are participating today are not in broadcast media. We don't hear your voices, and and I just would just like to know what, what kinds of things come to mind. Hi, it's John here. I thought I'd just check and see if you can hear me first of all. Out and clear. Yeah, very good. Well, this uh, this picture by Wynn uh, McNamee, he um, he went out uh, and was out on a boat uh, for many hours uh, uh, for this photograph. And like many of us who've, uh, who've covered this story, uh, there's a lot of time spent um, just getting where you need to be. And uh, just the logistics of getting to where he could make this picture in the first place were a huge uh, a huge hurdle and then uh, and then working with the this cup light as we've done uh, day after day on the story I, th I think it's a just a fantastic picture um I, without reading this caption I, I wouldn't actually know that it's anderson cooper um being uh being in the uk um i wouldn't really particularly understand the relevance of it being Anderson Cooper. However, I do understand that, um, you know, getting into this kind of situation where you're right, kind of on the, on the water, so to speak, has been quite a hard thing for photographers to do. So I wonder whether just in this situation there's a, perhaps a kind of an alliance between TV news, perhaps, that can uh, get that access and still photography that can benefit from it. That's a really good point, and I think in some ways the image itself highlights what you get when photographers are there. And one of the things I think about this image that's so compelling is um, the texture and the, the, you can see the structure of, of the oil and the water uh, in ways that aren't often communicated uh, in other images. And I think we'll see some other examples of that today, but for me, the, the sort of textural or viscous quality is really pictured um, uh, really nicely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as John was saying, though, that it, it's been quite hard to uh, to kind of find the access to these kind of pictures, I guess. Yeah, I just want to note for those of you, uh, look, if you look over to the left in the text box, Michael's going to insert the captions for each of the images as we work through them, so you can see the full caption there and what Michael just typed. John, I see a hand up. Did you have a question? Or No, I think it's uh, it, it's more me getting used to the, the system here uh, more than anything. Um, the as I mentioned before, um, just the, the logistics of getting around uh, and and getting getting fresh pictures that are different uh, uh, has been very tough. And and part of this um, part of this image here has to do with the fact that we're out there on the water, water. and. Um, and we photograph whoever we can find, um, whether it's rescue personnel uh, or, in this case, um, other journalists on the same boat. Is there perhaps, uh, like for the American market, an, an added uh, profundity um, to, you know, have a, a reporter like uh, Anderson there in the picture, kind of making it front and center a, a topic that they can then all kind of relate to in that sense? In the well, text comments, think, Nathan and, and Gerald are having yeah. a, a kind of conversation about whether this is ocean, whether this is marsh, and how that's pictured. And I wonder if one of them might want to jump in uh, verbally as well. It's Paul. Sorry, I'm just diving in without having. I'm using the wrong protocol. I think it's kind of interesting, though, this, this idea of Anderson Cooper as the figurehead of CNN now, especially now that Chris and Alan Paul has, has gone. And, and you know, the coverage, the, the, the rather negative coverage he got of being in Haiti. And I'm wondering how. You know, does the story become the media celebrity's presence there in order to validate the story or not? You know, in other words, why is a picture of Anderson Cooper even important in the first place? So what is it saying about the story that we almost need this kind of celebrity find and presence on a story in order to validate it or bring it up to the level that it's seen as being a, an internationally important event? Uh, I think that might yeah, be and... Folks can just dump in, too. I don't need to call on. Uh, I think that might be a, kind of a good way of reading it, but also perhaps a bit unfair, because um, as John was saying, you know, getting access to these kind of situations can be extremely difficult. Um, and I, I'd hazard a guess that in this situation, uh, Reuters and CNN 
um, either shared a boat or followed each other or found access at the same time. Um, and having a person in the picture obviously kind of gives it a, uh, a human dimension and actually brings it back. Um, but to a certain degree, I would agree as well because um, Anderson Cooper being a celebrity like that um, is obviously a better person to have in your picture than Joe Bloggs from the local Herald. And that's the one that gets circulated too, right? Erica, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, can you hear me okay this time? Is yep. It, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, I just I just wanted to um, sort of actually say similar things to what's being said. Is just you know it's it's clear from from the image obviously the the amazing access um, they were given. Um, I certainly haven't seen this sort of thing with my own eyes because it's been so difficult to get as close to the oil um, as as I may want to. Um, and and I do agree that it's it's so important, I think, to continue to reflect back to um, humanizing this this catastrophe because I think um, with with it being such a technological um, catastrophe, it, it can, it's very easy to, to look at um, the corporation and not and not at, at the human quality of it. Um, and so, in that respect, I feel like the image, you know, portraying the reflection of a of, of a person is sort of effective. But it's true that that because it's it's Anderson Cooper, it, it does sort of, for me, linger with this this ongoing question of 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 the idea of of the press and um, and the sort of celebrity of that instead of you know the focus on the people who are being affected and and you know using you know, using media as as additional PR for um, getting access to the to the catastrophe, as opposed to actually focusing on the catastrophe itself and how it's actually affecting the fishermen and um, the fisher people and and the local the locals here who are who are living with this. This Lorenz here, uh, Erica. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that this image seems to remind me of is the old saw that it's not really a story unless the media shows up. Um, I know that right now um, the story is going to change some because, well, you know, it's over, right? A couple of headlines and major newspapers said that. Um, do you think that that part of this image is that it's a big story because important media people are there? I, I think that you know um, I, I think that that's implied, and I think that it's the the implication of that is 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 something that um, I think is sort of dangerous. Um, you know, I've I've been down here for three weeks now, um, and you know we've had a lot of difficulty getting access to areas, um, but at the same time we're also seeing that there's just not that much media down here anymore. And there's there's not as much coverage, and I think there is this sensibility that it's not the hot topic anymore, because um, you know the PR and the media has definitely led people to believe that that it's it's a it's an over it, it, this issue is over, or at least it's um, it's under control. And I think you know these things are misleading, and um, and certainly the repercussions of 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 the situation, even if they have. Um, gotten the oil leaking under some form of control is, you know, years and years. Um, and we've been talking with people here who seem to feel like um, the media has given up on them. In the, in the context of um, thinking about notions of access and also thinking about how an image itself can kind of invite us to think about the future, um, I wonder if we might move to the next slide, which is uh, Carrie Goodnow's uh, image, in fact, and talk a little bit about uh, that image. It certainly suggests a particular kind of access. I'm going to click on it now, so hopefully you should all be seeing it. Um, it suggests a particular kind of access, uh, visual, uh, and maybe uh, behind-the-scenes access to the story. Um, and Carrie, I wonder, um, you know, in keeping with the bag's interest in focusing on the pictures and reading the pictures. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the ways that this photograph, you know, what kind of compositional choices are you making here in terms of what kinds of things you want to communicate to viewers? 
Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I had a conversation with Lorette a couple of days ago about um, how do you how do you show people in tourism, you know, in a photograph and representing the oil spill and how it's affecting people. And you know, we talked about you know the people on the beaches playing in the water, you know, digging up in the sand and all of that. And this was just you know an opportunity that I had to go up in the air and photograph it from looking down and. I saw these empty beach chairs and I thought, well, you know, that's very representative and, you know, I do have some images where I zoomed in on, on the oil and, and got that pattern and just in a single image, but then I thought, you know, it's very important to also include the human aspect of it as we talked about in the previous previous image and it was just a way for me to show, I don't know if it's, you know, um, subtly or or not, um, so that that's sort of why I tried to include the, the um, you know, the empty beach chairs in that. Um, you know, I don't know how that, if that helps at all. But. Yeah, I think it, Carrie, I, for me, one of the things, go ahead, go ahead Laura. It seems that a few people well, have been texting uh, in the box that they're not able to see the image, so if people could, Hit check mark if you can see the image that Carrie's just been describing with the beach chairs and the from above. Okay, so some folks are seeing it and some folks are not seeing it. So check the oh, X yeah. if you're not and the check mark if you are. Everybody, just if you just try to resize your uh, your screen, uh, the window screen. Sometimes that helps reboot the image. So just you know, slightly scroll up and down the screen or resize it. Sometimes it's a little bit slow coming through. I'm just going to try and reload the picture now as well so we get it. So you may see the image change to one of the pelicans and then change back to one of the uh, of the beach chair. Photo Boogie in the text box has also published um, the URL where all the images are, so that's another great uh, way to look at the images if you're not able to see them right above in your in your window. Thank you. Okay, so um, in the meantime, so we have a little bit of a Terry, maybe you can talk a little bit. Lorette, I think you were commenting, but we've been cut off here. Um, talking about this notion of yeah, I was, uh, I was the going future. To Uh, one of the things that we had touched on in the previous image had to do with access, and I know Carrie had talked a bit about that with me the other day. Uh, at the time she was in, um, uh, that she made this photograph, Carrie, you were in a military helicopter? Um, yeah, I was in, a, in an Army helicopter, and it's a spotting mission where the Coast Guard and the Army go up in a in a small helicopter called the Lakota, and they basically just look for oil and communicate below to the um, skimming vessels and other Coast Guard boats as to where exactly the oil is. Um, and they go up on a daily basis, you know, sometimes two, three times a day, and they take media up. I've had, you know, really no, um, no trouble on my end as far as getting up in the air on these missions, um, but that was, that was uh, where I was when I was photographing. Can I just uh, jump in and ask a little bit about access? Because it's, it's hard for us um, in the UK, uh, perhaps without so much coverage, to appreciate it. Um, but from my from our point of view, and um, from my point of view, I would kind of find it hard that there's difficulty getting access. When are, are we not talking about hundreds of miles of coastline and um, waters that stretch for? thousands of square miles and boats that people can rent and helicopters that you could, you know, take a privately to see this. Is, is this really such a difficult thing to get close to? Maybe John and Erica can address that. How hard has it been? You mean in the, in terms of getting close to the um, to the spill, 
or, or close sure. to any ev- um, kind of evidences of the spill. Um, the spill itself, obviously, the rig or the underwater uh, pipe is, you know, live TV. But the story is surely the the effects and the the places that it washes up. Is is it really that possible to restrict access to all those places? Well. Usually the oil is coming in um, at specific t- uh, places that, uh, depending on the tides. And so one of the real difficult things uh, in covering the story is that you're moving all along the uh, the coastline along the Gulf. And um, and that coastline is not a continuous coastline. It's um, it's a delta. Uh, there's uh, the, It's not a straight line. You have to go... Uh, to get from one part of the coast to the other, you often have to drive all the way up to New Orleans and then back to another place. Uh, and so logistically, in terms of dri- – you do a lot of driving. But also uh, in terms of actual access, uh, when I was there, um, once I went to um, I went to this beach um, and uh, I was told by a soldier that, uh, that I needed to go to uh, the community center um, there in Grand Isle uh, to get to the public affairs officer to bring me down. And I said, well, who does, who does he work for? And he said, uh, well, he works for BP. You have to go down um, with the BP, BP representative. Otherwise, uh, you can't get access to the coast. Right. I understand. Um, I, can I just jump in also just to talk about this picture for, of carries? I think that it's uh, effective for a number of reasons, like she said, with the deck chairs. But also I think it's the the parts are to the right of the picture that are kind of seemingly clear and then that big cloud on the left that, you know, even without the deck chairs, it just has a very ominous quality to it as, as well as the stains on the sand um, next to the very pristine sand. So I think uh, it is obviously the, the tourism and the illustration of that, but it's also got a very inherent kind of foreboding about it. I think that's yeah. true, and for me, it's also very interesting. There's a literally a kind of line in the sand drawn across, you know, the good beach to the, you know, affected beach, uh, and and that plus the composition of the chairs at the very top of the image, to me, right, is this a kind of impending sense of doom almost. For me, also, this is Michael. Uh, it seems to have a, a class resonance to it as well, uh, in that the beach. Uh, is very uh, w- uh, wide, uh, and the chairs look uh, very um, expensive. And uh, so whether or not that's really true, uh, it does feel like uh, one message to me is that uh, when uh, these devast- when nature, uh, when we have these natural catastrophes, um, perhaps uh, nobody is spared from the top of the economic food chain to the bottom. Uh, absolutely. Nathan, you had a comment that I have, I'm afraid I have not gotten it. Uh, hi. Uh, I've been thinking sort of sideways of this conversation about how we're so unused to seeing oil. It's always in containment. And so when it overspills, there's the, obviously the specific nature of the disaster, but just in general, we don't see oil very much. And how horrifying, but also, especially the last two images, it can be both also strangely beautiful. Uh, so visually, it's just something quite, quite unusual. We're used to seeing lots of different kinds of disasters, but there's a, there's a peculiar quality to this one that I, I, I can't quite get words around, but it, seeing so much oil is just not normal. One of the things I yeah, and that Lorette here. I'm sorry. Um, one of the things I, I'm reminded of in this photograph is the, I, the aesthetics of the Jaws posters when that film was first out. You know, with the the horror from below uh, coming towards the people or things that don't know it's there. Yeah, yeah. Erica, you had a comment. Yeah, I just I wanted to just um comment on this on this photograph which I think is beautiful and and is very effective in 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 many ways and one of the things that I that I find so powerful about it is is that you know the line of of chairs and umbrellas sort of has this very um kind of controlled and and um sort of rhythmic quality to it and and the chaos 
and the uncontrolled quality of the oil and the water and just the, the, the sort of the knowing of, of how uncontrollable that, that, that force is. Um, I think there's a, there's a really interesting comparison between these two elements that, that I think is really um, important. That might be a Absolutely. good transition, actually, to the next image, um, to the next image, Charlie Rydell's. Actually, we've got a pair of images, the very widely circulated uh, images uh, that he made. If we could move to that, Paul, I'm going to let you do that because I don't know if I have control so that everyone can see. Yeah, I'm not getting one either, Paul. Well, my screen just went blank, so I think Paul's working on that. Um, one of the questions that, uh, there they are. I think at least I'm seeing them now. I hope others are as well. Uh, click the yes box or the check mark box in your box, the green one, if you're seeing these, just so we can give Paul a sense. These two images, I, I, I don't have any data. I haven't counted. I imagine they are some of two of the most widely circulated uh, images of the crisis. And um, one of the things I think that we often tend to look for uh, fairly or unfairly in moments such as these is what will be so-called, you know, the so-called iconic photograph, what will be the shot that we remember, that we republish 50 years from now, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder if people are welcome to comment on that, but also let's talk about the images as images. And if we're willing to say that these images are remarkable and deserve to be recirculated, what is it about them? Uh, let's really read these pictures. Remember, if you can't quite see them, uh, you've also got the URL. You can go there and look at them as well. Yeah, I posted a link to the images to the juxtapositions. They're probably a little bit small on that link, but you can uh, see them in a new window. Um, Lorette here. Uh, one of the things that I keep coming back to is the pelican on the left. Um, just resonates in terms of a phoenix trying to rise and it does not have any chance of rising. The fact that it is still calling and its wings are trying to lift up is so horrifying to me. And I noticed that Gerald uh, also uh, talked about it as, as the image is raising the bar and, and so on. Um, so maybe we can we can uh, uh, pay attention to what he's he's posting on the left. I think his microphone's not working, but but for me that the pelican the pelican is is going to be in my mind's eye forever. Um, you know, Loretta, I hadn't thought about that. The power of birds as opposed to other animals. Um, go ahead. I just talked over somebody. Sorry. Sorry. This is Sandra. I just kind of wanted to point over to the image on the right. To me, it seems like th this is really like an, a different incarnation of an animal impacted by the oil because it kind of seems like it, it's attempting to crawl out, which is, I, I think, to me, is a new way of presenting that experience from the animal. Yeah, I think there's something quite, quite apocalyptic about the uh, image on the right, um, like you say, because it's so unidentifiable as a, as a particular animal um, and the oil and the, the situation um, has had that kind of effect completely on it. Um, so you can only really identify it from that tiny little eye. Uh, it's really quite a pathetic um, and terrible looking image of a, of a bird. Uh, Michael here, yeah, I, I, I think that um, when these pictures first appeared, and it, it was the third week, I believe, uh, of, of the crisis. And each week, the, at least the two previous weeks, we'd started seeing birds that had been affected by oil. But these did, I think someone said, raise the bar and were just really uh, uh, horrifying, ghastly. And, and maybe, although maybe it's an academic exercise to say, you know, is there an iconic image or are there iconic images from the crisis? You know, th these may be it. The, the, mum the, the mummified bird, to me, because it looks so much on one level like a statue, 
conveys a, a kind of dignity and also a timeliness uh, or ti a timelessness. It, it seems like something that on one level you you could see as a statue, something that would you know belong in a museum. And, and to that extent, it, it conveys a, a kind of a history making of resonance to it as much as it's uh, as, as much as it also is incredibly uh, visceral and, 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 and evokes a, a sense of horror. Yeah, Michael, I think you're right. For me, the part of the visceral sense is, again, that, that um, textural element, that, that feeling that you could reach into that image, especially the one on the right, and, and touch the goo and feel you know, the viscosity and, and one might imagine you know, being covered by this oneself. Uh, Lorette, you had a comment. Yes, I noticed that John said that, that things like oiled crabs and fish just don't have the potential for the same kind of anguish. And I, and I wonder, John, if you could talk about that, because it's a problem photographers always have, is looking for a subject that, that could best convey what you see. Well, certainly, um, I think all of us down there have, have tried to um, cover different types of wildlife that have been affected by this bill. Um, uh, I've seen lots of fish, and, and as I mentioned in the text there, crabs um, uh, and, and other types of wildlife. It, you know, the oiled bird is just, uh, it, it, it becomes the, uh, and we all knew it would be iconic. Um, I think most of us who've worked uh, that story uh, we searched for oiled birds um, uh, the whole time there, um, and uh, when these came out, uh, and Gerald as well had some really really impactful uh, pictures of oil birds as well. But these, uh, when these came out, this really uh, they really did set a new uh, and, and horrible standard um, for uh, wildlife photography on this uh, in, on this disaster coverage. John, since uh, since you just commented and, and talked a little bit about you know, photographers, what they seek out and what they're looking for when uh, when they're in a context like this, I wonder if we might move on to your photograph, uh, the photograph uh, of the beach. Um, can I can I just jump in with Can I just jump in? Sandra's asked a question sure. um, before we move on quickly. Is it hard to find oiled birds? Is the question from Sandra? Uh, I'd like to know. Um, I would say I would say so, um, and we know the problem is we know they exist. They're out there. Um, getting access to really any part of the story is tough, and specifically finding the birds, uh, I found so. Uh, there is of course a um, a center where um, a rescue center for these birds at uh, Fort Jackson uh, Center. Um, not uh, they. They give media access there, and you can photograph them there. But it's quite something different to see them on the beach. I think. Yes. There's um, there's a kind of wonderful parallel conversation going on in the text box. So I encourage folks to kind of be looking back and forth as we talk here. Um, this is one of the nice things about having the audio available along with the text and URLs and other things being posted. Um, John, we've switched now, at least I think on my screen, I have switched now to uh, the fourth slide that we're going to discuss today, which is uh, your photograph. And I would say that this is arguably uh, the moodiest, perhaps, of the pictures in our edit. And I wonder if it's fair to say that the tone of this photograph um, is suggesting your particular way of reading the crisis. Um, I see this as a news photograph in one sense. I mean, it's captioned as such. But I also see this as a real... Uh, kind of commentary on what's going on in the Gulf. And I wondered if you talk a little bit about how this photograph, uh, how you structured it, and what tone you were hoping to communicate. Well, this, uh, this picture was taken uh, in a little place called the Elmer's Island. Um, I, had, uh, I was escorted by a sheriff's deputy uh, down the beach uh, at dawn. Um, and the storm rolled in off the, um, off the no. Gulf uh, as I was there along the beach. Um, for me, it, it really, the sort of symbolic, uh, if you will, um, idea that uh, that the 
that, that worse was on the horizon, that this this wasn't over and that sort of, um, I don't know, uh, I hate to say stormy weather, but things things were going to get worse before they got better. Um, and, and that was certainly the case. Um, um, it got much worse. Here, too, I know I keep harping on this, but I really keep seeing textures, and I'm noticing in the comments uh, some folks are talking about how some of these things look like um, animals, uh, you know, body bags. Um, there's, again, a variety of um, natural, and we might say unnatural elements kind of emerging here in this photograph that, for me, make it really compelling. Erica, you had a comment. Yeah, one of the things um, I just wanted to say, too, that I think is so powerful about this image, um, and, it, and it, not just because of the mood and, and um, the quality of light and sort of the foreboding um, sense of things, but also um, it really does speak to the futility of the boom, booming efforts, and, um, and certainly what I've seen, and I'm sure um, folks who've been down here have seen as well, and um, I just I think that's such a um, powerful thing to to communicate as well. Just um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. No, I'd agree. I think it has this um, almost feeling of futility to it. Um, the way that the booms are kind of discarded at the end of the day, um, stacked up there, you know, like rubbish to take away. But there's really a whole lot more coming in from the from the sea, and it, and it just feels so. Um, so kind of not pointless, but so um, so much effort for so little gain in that method. Yeah, Michael. Yeah. Here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to mention. Um, this is John. Um, you know, I struggled with this uh, during the whole time I was down there. When you fly over uh, this spill, you see it's so vast. Uh, it's so vast, and it's everywhere, and it's. Uh, and it's very hard to capture. It was for me in a, still, in a single still image, as a, as, whether it was uh, over flights or just walking along the beach. That was really the struggle, um, and maybe more so in stills than video. Um, but that's another topic, um, just to, to show the, the, the dimensions of it. Uh, um, I, I, I got it right very few times, I think, uh, during those weeks there. Uh, yeah, Michael here. Uh, I'm glad to hear, hear uh, John uh, talk about the image uh, as so successful. Uh, we were a little nervous, actually, in terms of which John Moore image to, to use in the edit because there's uh, so many uh, to choose from that are, that are so um, impressive. Uh, but th this picture, to me, is, is incredibly striking um, in, uh, in, in its moodiness, I think. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a number of dimensions to it that really strike me. One is that uh, I find it, you know, uh, apocalyptic almost in its intensity. That, uh, but then on the same time, uh, it's more complex than that because, you know, you have the light uh, and you have the dark. So, you know, just when you start feeling like this is speaking uh, to hopelessness, the, the light and the breaking of the light, you start to feel like there's a, uh, a theme of hope there also. Uh, and then um, picking up on what Erica was saying, too, about the booms, I, I think on one level, more symbolically, you know, there's something so somatic about uh, looking at these booms that are the, the ones that have been uh, uh, used up and are so, soaked with oil. Uh, Alan Chin had a, had a photo that uh, had some of the same effect on, uh, on, on bag news. But, you know, I look at some of these images and the, and the booms, they look like human intestines. And from there, it's not much of a jump to feel like, you know, this is a d disaster that, you know, can, you know, literally rip your guts out. Um, and, and then I also think that, it, and again, it's, the photo is so rich, the, the tractor cuts and the sand to form the berm, you know, also reflect to me just how aggressive, you know, man can be uh, on the environment. And, you know, it, and then liter more literally, it just reminds me of this plan that um, Governor Jindal and others have been pushing or were pushing to uh, to bulldoze sand sand into the Gulf. Um, so I, I just think there's just so many things that this photo is doing. I, I just find it really impressive.
Gerald, I think you've had a hand up. I wanted to give you a chance to get in. Do you have audio now? I see a light, but then I don't see a light, so maybe not. Um, but I know that there are, okay, there are other um, comments that you've had about this image uh, throughout as well. Um, let me jump to Nathan for a, a, maybe a final comment on this picture. Uh, well, on this particular, uh, it's not so much on this particular picture, but on the, the comments about access and then um, being unable to, to, to really see it. And that's one of the things I find also very powerful about this whole disaster is the sense in which, to some extent, most of us are only going to feel it only very, very indirectly. If your life is not directly connected to, to the oil industry, if you're not down on the Gulf, um, you just don't feel it. And so here's this monstrous, enormous disaster, and it's remarkably intangible. And so the, the photos, I think, are actually quite successful at making it tangible. But as you say, the scale of it is almost impossible to, to be grasped. Yeah, I'm um I'm thinking especially of this the 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 idea that the last few pictures um and you know it depends on how whether you want to anthropomorphize the birds or not, but uh we've had Anderson Cooper's reflection and then we have images uh where there aren't people. Uh, and, and I find that kind of interesting uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is, uh, and Erica and others, and I know Erica and your work, you're interested in this, um, have been thinking about the effects on the people, what's going to happen when, right, when the story is quote unquote over, but as we know, not over, what media will or won't be there. Um, I was thinking that it might be good for timing purposes and for discussion purposes, maybe to jump, if we could, to slide seven, which is Erica's photograph. Um, of the cannot fish sign. And um, I'd like to talk about that, I think, here, because I, in some ways it's a kind of interesting pairing. Um, I'm now seeing it on my screen. I hope the rest of you are as well. Um, and Erica, to me, I see this, this image as, as really symbolically dense, uh, I guess you could say. And so I wonder if you might comment really briefly on um, some of the, I guess, for lack of a better word, some of the symbols and ideas that you were trying to organize in this image. Sure. Um, yeah, this this was our first day um, here. On we were we were in the um, Grant. We drove down to Grand Isle, um, which is on the, the South Louisiana coastline, and um, and this was really you know some of the first. Indications um, these the signs that people had put along the the highway go, driving down to Grand Isle, commenting um, on their situation. You know, fisher folk having signs up saying, you know, closed thanks to BP and all of this. And and so these were some of the first direct voices that that we you know quote heard um, from people along along the way. And this image really struck me. Um, because not only was it, you know, a local person's um, communication about the frustration, but to me, the the flag, um, you know, choosing to, to include the flag in this photograph, to me, really, was trying to deal with the complex issue of 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 the nationality uh, or the the sense of of who's responsible and and the idea that. You know, BP being a, a British company, you know, um, does that preclude our our um, our own um, use of oil? And and you know, it's just it's a complex issue, and it's it's very very difficult to 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 swallow it all. And um, so for me, this image was was you know trying to deal with the issues, th these sorts of issues. Um, Yeah, and I, I, again, I see that in the kind of um, uncertain relationship that you constructed between the sign and the flag. Um, and for me, this might seem like a minor visual point, but for me, the fact that the flag is is waving, right, and you can see the uh, the wind is kind of generally blowing off to the left of the image. To me, that gives um, 
the sign, which is itself relatively static, it gives the sign almost a kind of animation. So that for me, you know, the sign is kind of pulsing with this set of questions. What are we supposed to do? I think you're right. I mean, I think it's it's um, there. There's both. There's this. There is this sense of of staticness. How can we how can we move the oil? Um, you know, the oil is sort of taking has a life of its own, and it's moving with the currents of of the ocean, and and it has this sort of you know uncontrolled quality. Um, and of course, there's um, there's a lot of fear that comes up when we realize the kind of gravity and the enormity of this thing. And and so we look. You know, I think that we look for we look to our our leaders um, to help contain this this the enormity of it, and and yet we're we're not seeing a lot of um, a lot of real leadership in this, both in our own nation and in um, you know in the in the corporate uh, world of BP, and so it's it's complex, and I think that um, I mean I'd be curious to hear what other people. Um, think about this, how other people um, have been feeling about this in, in both images and in, and in the media and in their own experiences down here, how we deal with, you know, our own complicity um, as well as, you know, realizing that the responsibility of this is, is beyond just the corporation and our nation and, and um, but also as individuals. And I don't know, I think it's a really, really interesting and really um, deeply philosophical and complex issue. Uh, this is Nathan. This this reminds me. I was thinking of this very issue back with the first image too. To sort of read these side by side is that the oil slick with Anderson Cooper is is a very muddy mirror back upon us. You wouldn't necessarily know that that is Anderson Cooper, and this image also reflects the oil spill back to us. The other images do more indirectly. We sort of feel the horror of it, but both of those, I think, this image and the first one directly make a comment back onto us as a community and not just BP, but what does this say about ourselves? Um, this one in the form of a very direct question about livelihood. Yeah, photo boogie, question, comment. Um, yeah, I'd agree with Nathan um, very much so there, that they kind of do um, ask the question or almost demand a response from from the viewer in a way that some of the other ones actually uh, you live a bit longer with and they um, seep into your imagination. Um, the question that I have though is um, with these pictures they they obviously seem to work very very well in a very clear and you know present sense of this is what it's about. Um, with this particular picture though, and I have a, a feeling towards signage in general, I think this is the start of a very interesting set of pictures on how do people feed their kids? Um, if uh, there's a, such a huge uh, disaster, then obviously the, the news of it is one thing, but the way it manifests itself in people's lives is surely a much better thing to photograph. Um, so outside of the signage, I, I kind of like to see um, like the boats uh, tied up on the shore, the fishing boats that can't go out to fish. Um, these kind of real manifestations of people finding it hard to feed their kids, um, or else it's just a headline. Yeah, I, I I hear you, and and um and we have you know from here we went um, we have gone deep into into that we've met with the the Native American population um, um, sort of east of Grand Isle and went out in in the boats with with the Pontachian Indian tribe and and you know saw how it's affecting them you know they're they're um, their fishing areas are completely closed they can only um, you know, get crabs in in the canals, which um, the bayous, which are are no longer well, they're they're still open for the for the moment. Um, and I think it's true. I mean, but from there, you know, we've been mostly talking with fisher folk and locals about how how people are surviving. In fact, that's we're we're down here um, in in Ocean Beach, uh, uh, sorry, Orange Beach right now, um, interviewing people about how how they're going to sustain through this through this um, the catastrophe. And it's and I think it's important, and I think you're totally right. It's, it's um, you know, getting to getting underneath the veneer of the voices and getting to the people and the voices themselves, and um, and and looking at the real long-term effect 
um, that this has because it's not just today and tomorrow and this last few weeks, but it's how are they going to continue to to feed themselves for the next um, you know 10 years. And in some senses, that goes back to what Cara was saying about you know the great proclamation that the, the cap is on and it's all over, um, and actually. As you say, the story is far from over, uh, and that's the one that wants to be covered. John Moore, you had a comment. Yes, you know, um, this the relationship that uh, a lot of folks in Louisiana have with the oil industry also complicates um, the coverage quite a bit. Um, you would expect, with in many places, with a disaster of this size, that there would be huge protests um, not now and again, but every day, all the time. Um, and often the protest pictures that we've seen, a lot of the protest pictures we've seen to the, the BP uh, disaster have come from other parts of the country. Um, and uh, people in Louisiana, a lot of folks rely on the oil business um, for their livelihood in the past. And a lot of them expect um, that there will be some sort of payout, um, whether they're having their boats uh, hired uh, um, to help with the cleanup effort uh, in the present tense, or whether they're hoping to get money later on, I think uh, a lot of people are afraid to come out and openly um, protest uh, uh, and in a way that we would expect. The Loretta here. Um, I guess this would come as a question that I would put out to all of the photographers. One of the points that I often make to people is audiences generally think that that photographers can make photographs and will show us everything there is to be shown. But I know I've talked with a couple of you who have said none of the people I work for are interested in me showing the people who are not getting work, showing, showing me the stories of the people who are suffering uh, real changes in culture and livelihood. I, I know that uh, Erica is able to do this as a documentary person, but of course then you also have to find out how to make a living. Uh, I know Carrie has mentioned that uh, her, the people she works for are not interested in, in paying her to go and do those kinds of stories that we say, well, why aren't we seeing these stories? But I wondered if, if Gerald or John, uh, and, and actually Erica and Carrie also could address that in terms of, I know that there are things you want to show. Uh, what are we not seeing? Great question, Lorette. Well, I, I can speak for myself. This is John. Um, I did some of it, and I got I got at some of it, um, but I would have liked to do have done a lot more. It's um, it's as I mentioned, it's just really it's really complicated, um, and um, showing people not working um, that that does make pictures, uh, but uh, but it's it's not easy to do, and a lot of folks uh, a lot of folks aren't really all that interested. Uh, in, in us doing that. I found people who did want their stories told, but I found a lot of people who didn't. I think it's I think it's an interesting um question and it's certainly um a complicated one too. Um I mean we've we've been extremely lucky I think down here in in our abilities to be have access to people who are willing to connect with us about their personal experiences. But it's really complicated because oftentimes we'll meet with you know, um, one one spouse in, um, who is, you know, willing to talk, but you know, the other one is is you know on the boat that's been hired by BP, and so there's certain things that can't be said, or or you know we can't speak to to both um, both people, and it's it's interesting. I mean, I think I think one of the things that that we're seeing is um, you know or wondering about is over time how are these these the relationships between the, the the fisher people and the and the folks who are working now for BP in the, in the cleanup, as as that um, as that fades and they're you know no longer getting um, paychecks from BP, how is this going to affect you know these people's livelihoods and their family structures and and their relationships over time? Um, I think I think this is a really um, important aspect. That that isn't being um, isn't being talked about, and, and just in terms of access, 
or, or, or you know, publication. But, you know, I think it's one one benefit of, of being independent is that, you know, we we are able to to do these stories, um, you know, on our own and then and then find outlets to publish them. But again, like you said, it's it's more challenging in that sense um, to get paid for the work. So it's 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 a toss up. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's really important. Uh, Nathan here. I was just thinking during this whole last discussion about uh, what the visual field is going to be like post-containment, if we actually are post-containment, the rules of access that might change. Will we see more images, even more shots of oil, but oil that is being triumphed over and people going back to work? So we'll actually have much more visual information, but only when it's a more pleasant story to be telling so that the previous story is dampened in terms of our memories. Is that not the point then, um, like uh, the Carrie or, or Laurie or, uh, was, or Erica was saying, uh, for the independence of the uh, photographers to perhaps, you know, be given that uh, that extra choice of sticking with the story um, and saying in those situations um, it's not so uh, post-containment, there are people's lives still ongoing and affected. Um, and also being able to spend a, a longer period of time to create a body of work that really is far more um, compelling, and so, I suppose, um, and helps it get published in that way. Paul, you had a comment. Well, I mean, I guess what we'll probably see is a sudden opening up of photo ops as BT and the administration try to, you know, media manage it, and you'll get lots of pictures of birds being cleaned up and, uh, you know, photo opportunities with maybe the BP guys, you know, showing what a great job they're suddenly doing with the cleanup and the containment. And then I guess it'll be very much like what happened with New Orleans and Haiti and pretty much every other major either man-made or, or, or natural disaster. And it'll just disappear off the, um, off, the, off the media map until maybe there'll be an anniversary piece in a year's time kind of thing. And I think this is a really important issue for the media to take on. You know, huge amounts of resources in terms of manpower, financial resources, and so on, are, are dedicated to breaking news stories, as it were, and virtually nothing to them covering those stories as they carry on. Or even more importantly, trying to work out where those stories might be happening in the future. Because if you think about this whole BP issue, you know, clearly many of the oil companies were riding roughshod over all sorts of safety issues, all sorts of environmental issues in their deep, deep water drilling. Well, lots of people, you know, green and, and environmentalists trying to lobby against that, but it was completely invisible on the, on the media radar. And this is a really tough question for media practitioners, particularly independent media practitioners like ourselves, to take on board. How do we kind of flag up the potential of these kind of threats, you know, as they're coming up? And then how do we stick with them and how do we hang on in there afterwards in order to show how these are not just blips, as it were, that suddenly appear and then, you know, everybody's hunky-dory and happy, and happy afterwards? So you know, time and time again, we've seen the same pattern of, of a kind of a, you know, a bell curve in, in interest, as it were, with the peak being in the middle and then it disappearing very, very fast off the other side, almost like falling off a cliff. I think we've seen that already with this story. So trying to think about strategies for supporting independent journalism to, to, to do the stories before they happen, you know, to put down the, the groundwork for them, and then to keep on covering them after they happen, I think is a really key issue to, to try and take on board as an industry. Yeah, Paul, I think you're right, and particularly in light of the question of policymakers, right? So um, we might actually move on to the image of Tony Hayward in that regard. I don't know if other folks had comments that might kind of we might read, uh, consider those comments along an image uh, alongside an image like this, which um, is uh, dated in a way, but not dated for all of the reasons that Paul just suggested. And Kara, uh, look at the comment that John made in type. Many news organizations already have their budgets gutted by Haiti. Uh, again, the budgets are also going to predict what photographs we're going to see, not just the photographers, what they choose to photograph. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm particularly interested with this image of Tony Hayward. Um, to maybe hear a little bit from uh, some of the British folks uh, in, in, our, in our panel and our audience today. How does this image read for you, or how did it, or images like it, read for you um, from the British context? Oh, now I know why we were invited. 
Jenny, do you want to speak to that, Jenny? Because I see Jenny's got her hand up, and she I know she's British, so I'll, if she wants to pop in there. <laughs> right. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, that, it was more of a general point, really, but it, it, just talking about um, the, the whole range of these images, I was having a conversation with Michael and Paul about this last week, and just what really strikes me about this is that a, a lot of what these photographs are trying to do is to um, visualize the unvisualizable, I guess, and that's what's interesting to me about them, not because oil is invisible, but because it's actually, because of the nature of what's going on, it's, it takes a real um, skill and a particular kind of creativity for photographers to capture this, and a lot of what we're seeing is almost um, visual metaphors of what can we find that will represent the enormity of this because the enormity of it itself cannot be captured and that's in opposition maybe to um, a situation like Haiti where there are so many um, directly affected people who we can photograph I suppose and what this leads me to think as well is about um, the, the issue of the photographing of environmental and ecological issues going forward as well that this is only gonna I guess become uh, more serious it's a, we're only going to have more situations of gradual non visually dramatic changes to the environment that are difficult to try and visualize and to capture uh, this particular picture that we're seeing is obviously an exception to that because here is a person and it's obviously here is a person who is news in this sense but um, it's leading me to think about ecological issues going forward and the challenge that that's going to be for almost the, the creativity of photographers to find these kind of visual metaphors to represent the enormity of what's going on. I mean this image to me just looks like a corporate shoot straight out of a corporate ad for, for BP. It's got all those classic you know, if you were going to do a portrait of the CEO of BP for their annual report, you know, the pointing off into the middle distance is one of the classic cliches of that kind of, you know, corporate advertising photography. And I think, you know, even down to having the BP helmet with the logo on the front there and the rig in the background, it really does look like that sort of completely staged and posed, um, you know, corporate frame. But I think Jenny's point there was really interesting, and I wonder whether that's partly to do with the, one of the reasons why the editors have been loath to to, uh, to do much about the, the human impact of this, because in, in most cases, the humans have been separated from the environmental disaster by physical space. You, know, you don't have you know, the fishermen and the oil slicks together because they've been kept apart. Whereas, as Jenny said, with someone like Haiti or you know, a lot of earthquake style disasters, you know, the people are literally wandering through, picking through the rubble. And I wonder if that's been part of the problem. The editors have not been able to you know, work out a way to visualize the impact on the, on the, on the human beings, but also contains within the frame the story of the oil. And I think that's possibly part of the reason why, you know, we've had very little coverage of the human impact of this, because, you know, it's hard to show that in one frame. You, know, you don't have a picture of, as we said, a fisherman trying to fish in, a, in an oil slip, because they're simply not allowed to go out there in the first place. That's a great point, and both you and Jen's point uh, are, uh, work together. I've been thinking uh, about doing this whole discussion about, and we've talked about a variety of reasons, budgets, um, editorial practices, the, the, the very complicated work of photographing this kind of disaster, all the restrictions on access. It just feels to me that the, the visual memory of this disaster, despite, despite its epic scale, is, is actually relatively weak. I mean, the, we've looked at some great images, there have been some great images, but overall I think the visual memory of what's just happened or is still ongoing is strangely weak compared to many other phenomena that we've experienced in the last few years. Yeah, this is Michael. I think that's an interesting point. It, it, one thing that the, this all brings out to me too is how much uh, this edit is how much um, uh, personality really manifests now in terms of attracting attention, whether we're talking about the luminosity of Anderson Cooper or uh, actually, in the paper, uh, the paper this morning, we did see at New York Times, we did see um, uh, a wonderful photograph, lead photograph on the front page of um, uh, fishermen, I believe, and people in the Gulf that were uh, captured at a meeting. But uh, why were they on the front page? The reason was because another uh, kind of photogenic political rock star was down there. This guy, I forget his first name, Feinberg, the guy who had um, been the... Uh, uh, administrator of all the um, the funds for the 9/11 victims, and so he was the guy that they were all looking at in the photo. So in in a way, we really are in this kind of 
rock star era where the the the, the focus really uh, comes uh, is the focus is on these personalities, and then to the extent that uh, the, that the people that are uh, like the common folk are affected also, they're really just shown more in their reflection. That's a great point, Michael, and I hope folks are following the textual comments alongside here, the discussion of this image in particular as a kind of great leader image, right, the ultimate of propaganda. Um, and why don't we switch now to slide nine to get a kind of, I guess, different image of leadership or what constitutes or what leadership looks like. And that's an image of Obama, uh, President Obama uh, on the beach looking at tar balls. And I wonder what folks have to say not just maybe perhaps about the contrast between Hayward and this image, but about this photograph itself. I guess Lorette here. Uh, one of the things I was struck by is how, uh, as, as I think it was Gerald pointed out, you know, by pointing, uh, Hayward appears to look like he's saying he's in charge, whereas in this one, Obama seems to be looking at what it is exactly he's going to be having to deal with. I think in both images, though, um, like you said in the comments, uh, the written comments, um, that it's the propaganda that's behind the images, uh, propaganda, the you know the set up nature, nature of these images, uh, that both actually conspire to work against them. Um, Tony Hayward's trying to look all regal and in control and, and strong, and it completely subverts what's actually going on, subverts their image and subverts the message that they're trying to put out because we know that's not the case. Yeah, with the Obama one, it's the same choreography trying to give across a different message that it's kind of very considered, you know, take every little step, every tiny little piece of oil matters. Um, but again, that completely seems to be the wrong attitude to take to something that's so enormously large as an issue. And I think it's interesting that both focusing on the individual, as if the individual can solve the problem on their own. You know, Tony Hayward with a wave of his magic hand can, um, you know, resolve the issue and then President Obama can pick up every single tar ball across the whole uh, Lithuania coastline. And I find this a rather sad image. I feel like it's quite, you know, in a way, um, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but kind of belittling to Obama. It makes him look like he's kind of really confused and sort of, you know, oh, wow, is he really going to learn something by picking up a tar ball from the, from the beach there? And I wonder, I also wonder about quite a lot of these images where they're quite, um, they're quite tightly cropped. And I, I wonder whether this image would have been, how that would have changed it, you know, if it had been much smaller in the frame and we'd had kind of this huge beach with the tiny figure of Obama. Or maybe that was impossible. Maybe he is surrounded by his aid. But I think that's a really important thing to think about in terms of, you know, when we're, when we're, whenever we're looking at images, what is outside of the frame? And clearly what's outside of this one is a whole crew of, you know, photo op um, teams, the photographers, the TV crews, and all of Obama's aides and all of these people and so on and so forth. And, you know, when we slice these little fragments out from, from the stream of, of life, it's really important to bear in mind that one of photography's great abilities is to, is to slice out these little elements and, and make them really, really, really hone down or drill down onto the, these little um, iconic moments in a way that most of the mediums are not able to do, I think. You know, Paul, it's interesting um, to see the video uh, or to look at the video of this uh, photo shoot side by side with the still images because um, he, there was so many photographers there and it just he, he was completely surrounded. So it, it makes you really so appreciate, especially when the White House is involved, you know, how much the staging and, and, and establishment of a, of a photo op is because he just, it, it looks like a personal, solitary, and, and yeah, maybe actually a bit of a lonely mo moment in terms of your reaction, but this was a real scene. And then, of course, we've got The Economist um, taking the people out of the picture as well, and their cover that they ran the other week where they decided that, you know, they were able to remove uh, Obama's aid from the frame and just have him lonely staring out across the ocean there. So I think not only do photographers do it, but also increasingly it seems like magazines are happy to... Um, to seriously edit news pictures as well in terms of manipulating them. I think it's um, a good point. I, 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 I was looking at 
I'm sorry, just quickly. In, in both of these pieces, I think both of them exactly like Paul said earlier, um, they completely separate the people, the environment from the issue, uh, from the issue, and they try and reduce it to this kind of one figure, as though there's a blame or there's a savior. Um, and you know that's a necessary part, perhaps, of covering the story and looking for where the responsibility or the the answers may lie. But both of them, from the photojournalist point of view, are, are very limiting situations, and they play out that way in the newspapers. I just want to break in here quickly to let us everybody know that we've got about 10 minutes left. And so for those of you who are not panelists but who have graciously uh, given us your time and attention this afternoon, if any of you uh, have a question or a comment that you want to make about any of the images we've talked about so far, um, just raise your hand, click on the little hand raise button, and I'll try to get to a few of you in the last few minutes here. Um, but, Lorette, you had a comment, so uh, I'll turn back to you briefly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one of the things that Gerald has been typing is about uh, photographers' perception that uh, Obama is more standoffish, uh, that they recognize that Bush actually would go up with victims more often. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that we would perceive Bush as being more with people. I, it just, it's a different kind of propaganda to me, because one of the things I know that Zag News did some time ago after Katrina is look at the body language of both George and Laura Bush and how while they would go talk to more people individually, you could really tell in their body language that they were very distant. But, you know, that's, that's one of the, the, the things about photography. It, um, and maybe, John, you could talk about this as well, uh, since Gerald doesn't have sound. But you know, how, how does the photographer convey the reality of the situation? George Bush making everybody feel better because he's actually out there patting people on the back, and Obama not sending that same message so people think, oh, he's standoffish, and you know, he, he's not there. Well, I, I don't think we should uh, forget that um, that the uh, Louisiana coastline, uh, in particular, is a fairly conservative part of the country. Um, they may have wanted to limit his, limit uh, the risk of uh, an embarrassing photo shoot um, by exposing him to too many uh, too many locals uh, who probably have uh, some serious qualms with him uh, in the first place, uh, aside from the, uh, the whole uh, effort with the cleanup. Yeah, Erica, you had a comment. Well, um, I was just thinking, listening to some of the comments and, and looking at these last two photographs, um, you know, it's just, I think it's so important um, as photographers, but also as viewers, um, not to be misled by um, the quality of an image versus, um, you know, the, the actualities of the situation. And obviously, you know, both of these images of these these two leaders are are trying to convey a certain a certain um, a certain effect in order in order to for propaganda, and um, and I think that we need to look at their policies um, to really get the the full story. And I think there is a tendency with with these sort of iconic images to to forget policy um, and to forget what's actually happening on the ground that is in stark comparison to what this photograph of Obama may actually be trying to convey. Yeah, there may be actually a connecting point between um, uh, what Eric is saying in terms of the reality on the ground and then uh, also how these photo ops are conceived uh, and, uh, and conducted. This um, picture actually was, um, shows Obama on his third trip to the Gulf. So just a little bit of context. He went down twice before, both times on a Friday afternoon so he could be seen on the scene, but also where it was the very end of the weekly news cycle, so it wouldn't stir up too much uh, of a backlash given the uh, fact that people were uh, 
pretty upset in those first couple of weeks about uh, the role of the government. So the first time he was down there, the photo op, the selection was him on shore with the Coast Guard, a uh, very kind of um, official uh, and impersonal image. Second time, uh, second Friday afternoon, the following week, he was having lunch with fishermen. Um, so I think that when they finally did this shot, they felt like, the, that they really had, that Obama literally had to get more hands on. Um, so he was actually on the beach touching this toxic material and also, and then there was a series of shots of him meeting with, with cleanup crews. So it, it really was trying to get him, you know, closer to the, closer to the crisis. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'm just thinking it's interesting in terms of the stage of events, the way these guys are dressed, you know. Uh, Tony Hayward looks odd because he doesn't look like he's very comfortable in those overalls and that and that helmet. You know, it looks like it's set up. And you know, why is he wearing that when he's on the on the boat of a, on the bridge of a boat anyway? And Obama here, you know, there's a, there's a misfit. There's almost a sort of a genre um, slippage between the way these guys are dressed. You know, Tony Hayward looks very uncomfortable. He looks like he looks the CEO should be in a suit, not in a kind of boiler suit and a helmet. And Obama here somehow also looks like he's in the wrong clothes. He's like so he turned up on the beach in his in his flat, his business flat, and he rolled his sleeves up. He also looks out of place in terms of the clothing that he's wearing. And I think, you know, it's interesting when, you know, obviously photographers, media, I think photographers particularly, more so than T V crews, I think we're at we're often constantly in a battle between the PR machine of the photographer of politics and photographers trying to subvert that. And I think you see that in particularly in political election coverage, you know, people like Chris Morris's work. Um, you know, on, and so on. And I've done it myself covering rallies. You know, you're constantly trying to break that sort of force, you know, imposed reality that's been put on you by the PR people by trying to find a moment in the, you know, the classic one that people, you know, probably you actually won't remember this, but it was a classic PR stunt with Neil Kinnock when he was the leader of the Labour Party with his wife on a beach when they were supposedly kind of running along in the water and they fell over and, and fell in the water. And it, it turned out to be a total disaster in terms of the PR sort of coverage. I think it's a constant battle between, you know, visual image makers who are sophisticated and trying to subvert or undermine the, the PR machine in terms of trying to find a way to make these photo ops more interesting, more valuable, more, more discerning, really. But I do feel like somehow there's a misfit in both of these men in terms of the, of the clothing they're wearing with the situation they're trying to deal with. And I think that's, that's sending out all sorts of mixed messages to the viewer. I just want to jump in and let folks know that we've got a couple minutes left. And um, Lee Barber, I want to recognize you had a comment or question. Go ahead. Well, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for uh, this really wonderful discussion. And I just wanted to uh, ask a question about the ROV feeds that we've been seeing throughout this disaster. I mean, it seems like they've served to really distract and dehumanize uh, what's going on here. Um, I'm curious on the panel's take of this really weird contrast between the availability of images from this extremely remote environment versus the really difficulty in access and actually showing the people who are affected by this tragedy. Great question, Lee. I think it's kind of interesting. This is like the ultimate citizen photojournalist, isn't it? This is, you know, a completely remote digital camera, you know, because there's no other way in which the, the media can get access to the scene. It's almost like the, the absolute pinnacle of, um, of, of, you know, democratic journalism. It's a machine that's recorded. It's like a CCTV camera almost. And I think it's a very compelling space visually that's been created here, this kind of ticker tape flow and all the arguments about the amount of flow that's been happening and so on and so forth. And that's a really intriguing point about the fact that we've been able to see this. I think it was one of those things where maybe they, did, they, they made a mistake in allowing this footage to be seen in the first place, but once, it, once the genie was out of the box, we were then completely sort of hooked on it as, a, as an extraordinary uh, visual metaphor for the, the, this uncontrollable leap. And then obviously now, you know, the footage we're getting now of them having shut it down as this kind of, you know, closure, as it were, literally, of the story. It is very disconcerting uh, to, because, the, as you say, there's, there's been this endless flow, and we have been able to observe that, but it is 
it, it in a way, even though it's incredibly concrete, it really does become highly abstract since we can't see very well what's happening with all the oil that goes out of it. Uh, so it has a, a really strange and unique metaphoric capacity. It, it strikes me also a bit like the, um, the debt clock that used to tick on, I don't know if it still does, on uh, 6th Avenue in New York City. Um, it's just kind of a constant reminder. When you're not looking at it, it's still ticking away. Um, and I think that cuts through all the propaganda. Um, and the clock really is it. still there. Yeah, and so, you know, like the, like the pipe, it's, uh, you can kind of read what you want and hope what you want, but as long as this picture is still ticking away and you can see it, uh, it doesn't matter what people say, the, the problem hasn't gone away. I just want to uh, jump in briefly and let folks know that we um, are uh, officially uh, done with our time here, but if folks are interested in hanging around for a few more minutes and still want to continue to talk, we do have one more image we didn't quite get to and we could wrap up with that one if you want, but if you have to go, we understand that. Um, this image I think in some ways corresponds to one of the questions that Sandra, I think, and Lorette asked us to think about with uh, the edit as a whole, and that is, um, are we willing to talk about how beautiful some of these photographs are? Yeah, maybe uh, you John can get a Oh, go ahead, John. Well, you know, I, I think um, that's a very valid question, but that's it's it's the same in um, in any disaster, really. We cover. Um, we cover disasters, human disasters, uh, and, and oftentimes, uh, whether it's environmental or human, uh, some of the most striking images are also uh, somehow the most beautiful as well. Um, and the, the dichotomy between the, the dissonance between the, uh, the horror and the, and the beauty is, is sometimes what grabs people's attention and, and, uh, and keeps you uh, looking at that photo a few extra seconds or, or coming back to it later. Yeah, I just want to note folks who can see the image on the screen are probably seeing that uh, there, we do have capability of drawing on these images and someone has circled what look kind of like faces. Lorette, you, Lorette, you had a comment? Yes, uh, and, and you know, this would also be uh, directed to the photographers as well. One of the things that Michael, Shaw and I talked about was the fact that that uh, a Loewy from from seven photos uh, did a series of much more personal images, uh, close up some really really beautiful things. Is it, there's, but it, they're more contemplative about the beauty of the oil in this disaster. Say compared with uh, John's photograph of of the bagged stuff on the beach. That too is, is incredibly beautiful, just as Carrie's image from the sky is so beautiful. And yet these don't really speak to what's going on in the Gulf. Uh, they're entirely re removed from it and tend to see these much more as a personal statement rather than something that's helping us understand what's going on. Yeah, Paul. Well, I think it's you know I think it's um, it's a fiction to assume that the situations of great distress cannot have within them elements of extraordinary uh, one of better word beauty. I mean, you know, the, the coastline of Louisiana, I'm sure, is a very beautiful coastline. The oil and water create fantastically abstract, beautiful patterns. And I think what's very interesting about that is our response to it. And I think. Elaine Scarry's um, little wonderful little book on on, on beauty is a, a very interesting read in this in this in this capacity. And I think you know what I was what I took from her argument is that when we see a kind of a, a dichotomy or a, 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 in terms of you know a beautiful a beautiful, when we see beauty in terms of what we might call evil or distress, you know our reaction to that's often very complex and it's often going the wrong way. We, rather than thinking oh that that can't be right, you know beauty shouldn't exist. That. Well, I think what she argues is that we should see the beauty as being almost a kind of a, a leveling force or something to aim for, and we should think that, well, if there is a potential for beauty in this scenario, we should make our efforts 
to enhance that. In other words, we should move more towards the good, as it were. And she sees beauty as reflecting good or worthiness rather than evil. And I think that's a really interesting kind of angle to take on this, you know, in the old sort of chestnut of the chest of emphasization of the ethics of aestheticization and so on. And that we too often respond with a very kind of media like, oh, you cannot have beauty in the face of horror. It's impossible. And yet, clearly, you can. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's something, it's a visual trope that comes up time and time again. And, you know, what, what John's picture reminded me all of a lot was, you know, obviously someone like Simon Norfolk, you know, Battlescape of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, you know, where we can read into or turn and picture yeah. of, of, you know, um, the wrecks of ships in, in, in great storms and so on. We can read into these sort of dramatic epic situations an ethic awesome in the true sense of the word beauty. And I think, you know, these two things can coexist. And in fact, beauty can be a call to action and not just admiration, as uh, to, to sort of paraphrase another one of the, the critics of the aesthetic versus ethics argument. Uh, I actually thought that this image was, uh, at least from a, a media standpoint and talking about photojournalism right now, is actually fairly subversive. Uh, it, you know, and, and really pushes the point of how much there's a, a possibility of, uh, or a tendency even uh, to now to, to aestheticize the news. And especially seeing how so many images are now and stories are just being reported by, uh, in the m mainstream media on their uh, websites by just creating these huge numbers of photo galleries with captions and really no other, little other context. Uh, Lowy, who, by the way, uh, shot this uh, this series for GQ, uh, is is uh, I, it seems to me on one level turning the disaster into an art poster, or even more specifically in terms of you know the how much stuff's being distributed online now into like a wallpaper or even a computer screensaver. I think it's great. Uh, I so completely agree with you, Michael, but I I think it's terrible. Um, uh, you know that you you can certainly inhabit different places with your photographs, but it, it doesn't say half as much uh, in terms of the intention and the kind of um, the fulfillment of the story by the photographers on the ground and, and actually what's going on. Uh, it just tells the story of a body of work, um, and like you say, it's a, it's either a screensaver or or actually I think it's probably a print for sale in the gallery for a lot of money because it's rooted in the real. Um, and I think there's terrible subversion with that. Well, I agree with you. I think it's great because it is terrible. Well, that I can't argue. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think we could keep going on with the, uh, because the, the, the photos have such great impact and, stu and stimulus. I, I, again, just really want to uh, thank uh, the photographers, uh, uh, Eric and John and Carrie for being here, and and very much appreciate Gerald, and 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 I'm really sorry that uh, we couldn't get uh, to hear you uh, uh, orally or in audio, but uh, you just uh, had a great impact in terms of the uh, uh, textually. So um, I want to thank everybody on behalf of uh, uh, Bag News Notes and uh, thank Kara, thank Paul. Uh, and I think this has just been really successful and I uh, look forward to doing it again. Yeah, can I just come in there as well, Mike? I mean, I absolutely echo those comments. And I think this session has been exactly what we set out to try to achieve with Open Eye, which is, you know, mixing together practice, practitioners, uh, theory people, critics, um, you know, in a really rich mix in, in, in a discussion about really contemporary issues. So for me, this has been a brilliant session. I uh, really, really enjoyed the to and fro of the debate. And very much absolutely bang on with our philosophy of trying to bring together lots of different voices all interested in the same topic of how does photojournalism represent the world. But in mixing together people that perhaps quite often don't get to engage with each other in debate and discussion. I think it's been a great, great session. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very, very much. And absolutely, Michael, hopefully we'll make this a regular kind of uh, meet up with, with Bag News Notes and Open Eye and then really drill down on some more contemporary uh, photographic issues and so on. So again, I'd like to thank all of the presenters and all the audience for, for taking their time out on a Sunday evening, afternoon, morning, depending on where you are in the world. And um, just absolutely brilliant session. Well done, everybody. And thank you very, very much. Uh, Kai, do you want to make any last comments before I switch off the archive? 
I think maybe my last comment will be that this uh, will be archived, right, Paul, so that we'll uh, have a chance, uh, folks who weren't able to be here in real time will be able to experience it. So definitely let people uh, know that uh, with a certain uh, lag time, I'm not sure what that is, maybe Paul can let us know, uh, this discussion will be archived and, and other folks can uh, tap into all of the ideas and images here. And um, I'm very appreciative of being able to uh, moderate a discussion with people that I could never be in a room with, right, because we're all far flung. So this is really wonderful. Absolutely. The archive will be available. It will be an MP4 file, so we'll be able to give that to the Bag News Notes and post on our website. Also, um, you know, we'll host it up on OpenAI. And just a quick plug, uh, we have got another session coming up. On uh, July the 22nd at 1500 GMT, which is about photographing the personal, with some really interesting photographers looking at how they photograph their own family life. And uh, if you're interested in that, uh, you can send me an email. I'm going to pop my email up here at the end, and I can send you more details on that. So again, once again, thank you all very, very much for attending today. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have all the a best. great day or evening.